Hello and welcome to this session in which we would look at direct financing lease accounting. This topic is covered in intermediate accounting as well as the CPA exam. This topic, specifically direct financing lease accounting, gives students issues for multiple reasons. One is you have to understand how the time value of money works if you are dealing with leases. Also, we have different type of leases. We have sales type lease, we have operating lease. Now we have direct financing leases. Then we have accounting for leasing for the lessor as, a, as well as accounting leasing for the lessee. So notice there are so many different combination. In this session, we'll focus on direct financing lease. Now, whether you are an accounting student or a CPA candidate, especially if you are an, a CPA candidate, I strongly suggest you take a look at my website, farhatlectures.com. I don't replace your CPA review course. What I do is I explain the leases in details separately each type of lease let's see let's sort with examples so i can be a useful addition to your cpa review course by helping you understand the material better you can add 10 to 15 points to your cpa review score past the exam now your risk is one month of subscription your potential gain is passing the exam this is if you subscribe to my website. Also, my website is designed to mirror image your CPA review course. So I have a CPA review course for Wiley, one for Becker, one for Roger, one for Glime. So they match they match your CPA review course. So it's easy to find the information. And if not for anything, take a look at my website to find out how well is your university doing or not doing for the CPA exam. Also on my website, I do have various cover, including intermediate accounting, as well as many other courses. Please connect with me on LinkedIn if you haven't done so. And on LinkedIn, you can view my LinkedIn recommendation, students who use my system to pass the exam so you can get a better feeling, more confidence about my product. Please like this recording, share it, connect with me on Instagram and Facebook. So the first thing I am going to go over is this graph. And hopefully by looking at, by the, if you are looking at direct finance leasing, I'm assuming you know what is sales type of leasing and you know what's operating lease, sales type or finance lease, whatever you want to call it, or capital lease. Okay, so let's take a look at this decision tree. And remember, the lease for, for, for a sales type lease to be considered a capital or a finance lease, it has to meet one of these five criteria. What are those five criteria? Transfer of ownership. Does the lease transfer ownership to the, of the underlying asset to the lessee by the end of the lease? If the answer is yes, we are dealing with a finance sales type lease. If the answer is no, we look to the next question. Does the lease grant a lessee an option to purchase the underlying asset? That's and that option price is reasonably certain to be exercised. It's basically a bargain. It's called the purchase option test. If the answer is yes, we're done. We're dealing with a finance lease, sales type lease. If the answer is no, we would look at the third question. The lease term is the lease term for the major part of the remaining economic life of the underlying asset. Here they're saying the remaining economic life. Usually what we look at is 75% plus. If the answer is yes, then we are dealing with a finance lease. Otherwise, we go to the fourth question, the present value test. And we're going to be focusing on the present value test here in this session. Does the present value of the sum of the lease payment and notice plus and any lease residual value guaranteed not reflected in the lease payment equal or exceed substantially all, all of the underlying asset sphere value? And hopefully you are familiar with these tests. Simply put, if we take all the payments plus the lease residual guarantee, that's assuming it's guaranteed, and we add them and we find the present value for those, we add the present value of those two payments, do they exceed substantially all of the underlying fair value asset? And this number is 90%. So do they represent 90% of the fair value of the asset? If the answer is no, we are dealing with a finance lease. Otherwise, the last question is, is this asset have any alternative use? If the answer to all these questions is no, we cannot have uh, lease classify as an operating lease. It cannot be a finance lease, a sales type lease, sales type lease. So this is what you should know this. You should know this information if you are looking at direct financing lease. Now we're going to be introducing a new category. Here we go. Lessor, remember, you know, we're dealing with the lessor, the person that's leasing the asset can use a third lease qualification, which is called the direct financing lease in one special situation. So we need to discuss this special situation. And once we need to discuss this special situation, we'll see the journal entries for it. 
when the lessor give up control of the asset to the lessee, but there is an involvement of a third party. This is important. So simply put, if you remember this test here, the present value test, the present value, we have to add all the lease payment and any residual value that's guaranteed. Okay, together, they have to exceed 90%. Under certain circumstances, a third party, so rather than the lessee and the lessor, a third party will guarantee the residual value. When you have a third party involvement, you might have a direct, a direct financing lease. It means you will add the direct, the third party guarantee, and if the third party guarantee, residual guarantee, exceeds 90%, which is the substantial, substantially all of the underlying asset fair value, then you are dealing with a direct financing lease. So on the direct financing lease, we are looking at three parties, the lessee, the lessor, and the third party. Simply put, again, if it meets, this is another picture of this, if it meets any of these five options, you have a sales type finance lease. If it does not, you have an operating lease, unless you have a third party that's guaranteeing the residual value in this transaction. Under those circumstances, you will have a direct financing lease. So what happened is you are passing this test through the third party guarantee, and we'll see an example how it works. Now, the basic difference between a direct financing lease and a sales type lease relate to when do we book the profit on the sale? When do we book the profit on the sale? And when, when I say finance lease, we're looking at sales type. So just FYI, sales type lease. So when do we book the profit on the sale? And a sales type lease, and hopefully you understand this, we book the profit immediately. When we book the journal entry, I will work an example to remind you how we do so, because it's important to see the sales type lease vis-a-vis -vis the direct financing lease. In a direct financing lease, you're going to see the profit is deferred and recognized over the life of the lease. So whatever profit we make from financing this transaction, we are not going to book immediately. We are going to take this profit over the, the, life, the life of the lease. The best way to illustrate this concept is to work an example. Assume that robotics company, which is the lessor, and enters into a lease agreement with Amazon for the use of quick robotics package pickers. So Amazon wants to lease a, rob a robot. The lease commencement date January 1st, 2021. The lease term is three years. The lease agreement is non-cancellable, requiring, it means you can't get out of it, requiring equal rental payment at the end of each period. We are dealing with ordinary annuity. The picker, which is the robot, has a fair value at the commencement of the lease of 30000 and a carrying value of twenty eight, with an estimated residual value of 6000 at the end of the lease. Okay. So here's what we have. This is the fair value. This is the cost of the asset and the 6,000 is the residual value. The estimated life is five years. Amazon provides a guarantee that the residual value will be at least 6,000. So notice in this transaction, in this transaction, we have robotics and Amazon and Amazon is guaranteeing the, 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 the residual value of the robot. There's no third party involved here. Notice the lease contain no renewal option and the picker revert to robotics at the termination of the lease. So notice when Amazon's not going to own it, it's going to go back to to, uh, to robotics. Okay. Robotics sets the annual rental rate to earn 6% per year. This is the implicit rate on their investment. So the first thing we're going to compute is the payment that robotics going to require Amazon to pay. So the first thing we're going to compute the payment. Hopefully we learn how to do this in prior session. We'll do it again. So here's what's going to happen. The fair value of the lease payment is 30,000. Then we subtract from it the present value of the residual value, which is 6,000 times the present value factor three um, N equal to three I equal to 6%. You might be saying, Professor Farhat, where did you get the 0.83962? If you are studying leases, you should be pretty comfortable with the time value of money. If you are not comfortable with the time value of money, this is where you would go to, guess where? Farhatlectures.com. And I have lessons. The first thing when I start my less, my my CPA courses that's that goes with your CPA course is the time value of money. So if you're asking where did this number coming from? Well, 
This is what I suggest you do because I cannot explain the time value of money now. The assumption is, is you know it by heart. So the present value factor is 0 0.83962. Therefore, the amount is five. The present value of the six thousand is five thousand thirty-seven dollars and seventy-two cent. You will take the fair value minus the present value of the residual value. You will come up to this number. This is the number that the lessor will need to recover from the lease payment, which is this much. Now, what we do is we'll take this amount and we'll divide by the present value of the annuity factor. So we're going to take this number and divide it by the present value annuity factor. Again, n equal to 3, 3 periods, i equal to 6. And the factor is 2.67301. The payment is $9,033.38. Uh, $9,338.64. This is the payment that robotics expect to be paid from Amazon. So all I, well, all what I did is find the payment. Now, what type of a lease is this? That's the first thing, because this is the most important thing. Well, let's take a look at what we have here. Well, we have the five test. Transfer of ownership. Did the, did the ownership transfer? Nope. Transfer of ownership that did not occur. The asset revert to robotics. So there's no transfer of ownership. Purchase option. We didn't see a purchase option, a bargain purchase option. The lease term. Well, the lease has uh, the lease term is three. The life of the asset is five. Three divided by five is sixty percent. So it does, didn't meet any of these tests. Well, let's see if the present value test. The present value of the lease payment. Now let's compute the present value. The present value of the the payment is nine thousand three hundred thirty eight dollars and sixty four cent. We're going to multiply it by the present value factor, n equal to three, i equal to six. That's going to give us twenty four thousand nine sixty two point twenty eight. Then we add to it. The present value, remember the, the Amazon's guarantee in the residual value, we add to it the present value of the residual value and will give us this number, 30,000. Well, 30,000 is 100% of 30,000. So it's more than 90%. Therefore, the present value of the payment plus the present value of the residual value, the guaranteed residual value, equal to, oh, not equal to, equal exactly to the fair value. So we are dealing with a sales type lease right now. We're dealing with a sales type lease. And everything that I'm doing so far, I hope you are comfortable with this because we should have reviewed or explained this topic. The reason I'm doing this first, then I when I move to the direct finance lease, it will be a very small switch that you have to be aware of okay and there is no indication that this asset has any has any alternative use therefore this is a sales type lease under number four under number four now let's do the journal entry for the sales type lease again the, every everything that i'm doing now should be a review the, uh, the robotics will debit a lease receivable of thirty thousand. They will debit cost of goods sold of 28. They will credit sales revenue of 30,000. They sold it and they remove, they remove the robotics from their inventory for 28,000. So the first thing I want you to notice is robotics booked a profit of 2,000. And this is a sales type lease. They met one of the five options, which is the present value. Therefore, they book 2,000 of profit immediately when they make the sale. Now, I'm going to switch I'm going to go into switch the scenario. Let's assume the residual value is guaranteed by an unrelated third party. So Amazon is no longer guaranteeing the residual value. Okay, who's guaranteeing the residual value? A third party. The lessor classified the lease as a direct finance lease. Here, what they're saying is, guess what? We did not really sell it. We're financing the lease. Do you see what's happening here? So that's the assumption here that we are making. We are making that the guarantee residual value, what makes the difference, whether a lease is a sales type lease or a direct financing lease. What what entry do we make if this is if we if we now we say that this is a direct financing lease? We still have a receivable of thirty thousand. We no longer have a sale though. We are going to credit inventory for twenty eight thousand and the profit of two thousand. It's not going to be booked now. It's going to be called a deferred gross profit. You have to know that deferred gross profit is a contra receivable, contra asset, specifically contra receivable. And that's why we are starting with a balance on the credit side of deferred profit of 2000. Okay. So what happened is this 2000 here that we considered a profit under the sales type lease and we booked. Now it's being considered deferred gross profit. And what are we going to do with this? We are going to earn it 
earn it over the life of three years. So simply put, we're going to take 2000 and earn it over three years. Now, if you're asking if it's going to be the straight line equally, no, it's going to, it's not going to be equally. This is what's going to make this is a little bit more interesting. But this is the initial entry. So this is a sales type and this is direct financing. What is the difference? The difference is in, it became direct financing when Amazon did not guarantee residual value, a third party guaranteed the residual value. Okay, now we need to know how to process the journal entry. Okay, because under sales type lease, we already learned how to do this when you make the payment. Now we need to learn how to do it under direct financing lease. Okay, the first thing we do in a normal sale, robotics would, re would, would, would receive lease payment over the life of the lease, which which on the present value basis equal to 30,000. Simply put, look at here, we have a, a lease receivable of 30,000. You see this? A lease receivable of 30,000. Therefore, what we're gonna say, we're gonna, we're gonna amortize this lease receivable at 6%. Notice here, we're gonna treat it as first, if it's a sales type lease. So notice here, although it's direct financing, but we're gonna need this amortization schedule, you will see why. We're going to start 1120, the balance of the receivable. We have a receivable balance. Then we're going to make the first payment. We have an annual lease payment. We already computed the payment. Then we compute the interest on the receivable. How do we compute the interest on the receivable? Well, we're going to take the the 30,000, the present, the previous, the beginning of the period, lease receivable times 6%. That's going to give us 1,800. The remaining is a reduction in the lease receivable. Now the lease receivable is $22,461.31. Then we're going to do the same thing. Uh, a year later, 12 31 21, we're going to get another another payment. It's they're going to pay us $9,338.64. The same payment will, will always be the same. The interest is $22,461.36 times 6% will give us the interest and simply put this payment part of it is interest first you find out the interest what's left is receivable a reduction in the receivable then this receivable would reduce the 22,461 to 14,470 then we're going to make we're going to get the third payment same thing the third payment will be split between interest and the interest is based on the previous book value of the receivable times 6% and the remaining will go to the least receivable the least receivable will reduce the previous balance of 14,470 to 6,000. Then here comes the guarantee residual payment of 6,000. The balance of the receivable is zero now. So notice what's going to happen. The interest that we earned, so please listen to me carefully here. This is important. Listen to me carefully because you're going to be, you're going to be, you're going to thank me like five minutes later if you listen to me carefully here. The interest component of the lease is 4,000 $15.92. This is the interest component. Simply put, robotics, because they had a lease of 30000 they wanted to earn 6%. They're going to they're receiving payment of $9,338, three payments. Therefore, the, the interest that they earn on this deal is $4,015.92. Hold on a second. Yes, that's interest. That's fine. But then they also earn, or they're going to be deferring $2,000 of profit. So the interest is a separate component. They're going to be earning interest on this deal. That's fine because they're financing the transaction, but also they're going to earn a profit on, in quote, the sale of 2000. How do we find out how to amortize? So we're going to have to create another schedule. And I don't think on the CPA exam, they would ask you to book entries for direct financing lease, but we're going to do it anyway, just so you're comfortable with it. Okay. So here's what's going to happen. You're going to have to create another direct financing lease amortization schedule. Here, you're going to start with your net receivable. So simply put, in a direct financing lease, robotics receive the same payment, which is uh, uh, receive, uh, robotics receive the same lease payment, which is on a present value basis equal to 28,000. Now, what we have to do, what we have to do, remember, remember, they sold the additional 2000 is profit. Therefore, the present value is based on 28,000. Now, what's going to happen? We have to choose an interest rate that's going to amortize this 28,000 over, over three years. Now, I never saw it. I never, at least based on previous, previously released AI CPA questions. Usually, if they ask you the question, they will give you this rate 9.5. This rate 
it's going to amortize this 28,000 net lease receivable. Okay, so where did the 9.5 came from? Well, obviously you have to compute it, but you don't have to compute it. It will be given to you if that computation is necessary. Now we're going to amortize the lease under as, as a lease receivable of 28,000. And you, you will see why in a moment why we are doing this and using the interest rate of 9.5. We're going to go through the same thing, same concept. We're going to say the payment is $9,338.64. We're going to take this amount, multiply it by 9.5, and that's going to give us the interest on the receivable based on a 9.5, based on a 9.5, 9.5 interest rate. You might be saying, what is that interest rate? So I'm going to tell you what it, what, what it is. Okay. Remember, we, we are earning interest of of 6%. So the interest of 6% in dollar amount over the life of the lease is $4,015. Remember, we still have to book another 2,000 of profit. To tell you the truth, the difference between 9 point, not the truth, to, to just explain what's happening here, you have 9.5 minus 6% is 3.5. That extra 3.5 is, it's going to represent this 2,000. And you will see that in a moment. Now, so, um, so this is how we're going to be doing the amortization. We're going to say nine, nine, $9,338.64. Part of it is interest. Part of it is a reduction in the lease. Again, the same concept. This amount would reduce the lease to $21,321.36. Then the process repeats itself. We're going to say, okay, we're going to be receiving the second payment. Part of it interest based on the new balance of 21232 The remaining is reduction in the principal and the balance will go down to $14,008.25. And the third payment, you guys catch, got the concept. Then we receive 6,000. Notice what happened to the interest under this schedule. The interest under this schedule is $6,015.94. So notice the difference between them, guess what? $2,000. So what's the difference? Why? So why do we have to schedule? The reason we have to schedule is because when we, when we are booking the journal entry, we have to amortize some of that two thousand. We have to turn it from the third profit. You remember we have two thousand of the third profit. Remember that T account I showed you, the third profit when we first book the entry. We have two thousand of the third profit, and we're going to be amortizing it. So that's why we need those two schedules to find the difference. So how much of it is truly interest? Of the revenue and how much of it is the third profit so that's why we have to prepare those two schedules okay and that's why i don't think you will be you'll be expected to this to do this much on the exam i mean who knows they might give you a problem like this but i highly doubt it let's look at the journal entry now we're going to debit cash nine thousand three hundred thirty eight dollars and sixty four cent we're going to be receiving a check from amazon for that amount now remember now we are ready to book some of the profit of the deferred revenue. And the deferred revenue will be $860. How did we come up with this figure? Here's how we came up with this figure. That's why we have two tables. We're working from two tables. We're going to take 2660 And we're going to subtract from it the interest component of 1800 the pure interest component. As a result, we're going to have the third revenue of 860. So this 860, so what happened, let's go back to the deferred, deferred profit account. Remember, we started with 2,000. Now we, we reduced, we, we recognize 860 of it. Now this is, now we have a new balance. Okay. Now, what is our revenue? What is our total revenue? Our total revenue is 2660. Our total revenue is right here. This is our total our total lease revenue. But remember, part of it is 860, part of it is interest. But this is what we credit. We credit the lease revenue. And obviously we have to reduce the receivable 7000 7538. Okay, 5,730. So notice we're using two different tables to, to book the entry. Again, the reason is because we have part of the revenue is interest, part of the revenue is the third profit. In a sales type lease, we only have interest revenue because the profit was booked at the beginning of the lease. In direct finance lease, which is this session, this is what makes what make this is a little bit not complicated. It, it takes several steps. Now, let's go ahead and make the 
second uh, well this is the third this is the again this is the first payment now here's what you can do again so you'll understand this better if you want to understand this better this is an amortization schedule for the deferred gross profit we're starting with 2000 the first payment remember the interest component the total revenue was 2660 the interest component was 1800 the difference between those is the amount of the third revenue now we still have the third revenue of 11 1140 next time we receive another payment the deferred revenue is 677.85 and our deferred revenue will go down to 462 if we're looking at a t account so we're starting with the third profit we started with 2000 we're going to reduce it by 860. We're going to reduce it by 677.85. We're going to reduce it by 462.15. As a result, the deferred profit will go down to zero. Okay? So this is where you get the deferred, the deferred profit component for every payment. Okay? And remember, it's being amortized. It's being spread over three period. Over three period. How did we do it? Well, we have to prepare two schedule to determine which part is is the third profit which part is interest uh, which part is interest revenue and uh, book it appropriately now how do we report things on the balance sheet because you could be asked about this well after the first payment what's going to happen is your least receivable will be the gross amount minus seven thousand five hundred thirty eight dollars and sixty four cent the reduction in the least receivable therefore will be twenty two thousand four sixty one then Less, remember, the deferred gross profit is a contra receivable, so you're going to reduce it from receivable. 2000, we started with 2000 minus 860, which is give us remaining 1140. So the net receivable after the first payment is $21,321.36. Now, after another payment, you would reduce by the, you would reduce it and you would reduce this by six so next period it'll be reduction by 677.85 and the 22,461 will be reduced by the amount of the principal which we'll see next let's make the entry for 21 again the entry for 21 the cash is always the same the deferred gross profit i already showed you it's going to be 677.85 the lease revenue is 20 25.53 and we have a reduction in lease receivable of $7,990.96. Again, going back to the schedules, going back to these schedules. So if, you, if you're wondering where this is coming from, 20, 20, 20 25, 53, and 79, 7,990, they're all coming from these tables. Okay, so this is the revenue, and this is the reduction in the receivable. Okay. All right. Uh, that's the second payment let's take a look at the third payment the third payment same exact thing the cash is the same we know that the third gross profit lease revenue and a reduction in the receivable a reduction in the receivable okay so the, we may obviously um you can make uh, the, the, the this is 2022 if there's more payments you know how to do the payment and guess what's going to happen last last we're going to be receiving an annual lease payment of 6000 because it's a guaranteed residual value they're guaranteeing this amount we debit inventory put back the inventory back and credit lease receivable we remove the lease and we debit back the inventory so this is the last entry so this is the life of a direct finance lease simply put this is the life of a direct direct finance lease you can again review the schedules uh, to get comfortable with the numbers where every number is coming from so on and so forth but this is the best way for me to explain the concept for you once again um, i would not worry too much about direct financing lease i'll be comfortable i will be i will be comfortable with it um in a sense that you know it involved a guarantee of it by a third party i highly doubt it you'll be receiving a simulation on it it doesn't mean you won't but i highly doubt it but you might have to answer a multiple choice question about it so i gave you more than a multiple choice question make sure you are prepared to do so once again if you um, take a look at my website farhatlectures.com i create my courses to mirror image your cpa review course good luck study hard and stay safe